like Pope said, we're going to focus on uh, key ideas, mainly uh, uh, jungle-centric, but that doesn't mean that you're not here to pay attention, right? So, um, uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, game key timing, some important times in the game, and then the things about jungling, such as uh, how to track the jungler, uh, vertical jungling, reverse clearing, cross map play, and then we'll take a break and we'll go on to warding, understanding the 1v2 lane for bot lane, and late game objective control. Um, so yeah, I... Okay, let me just ask some questions here. So, um, about the uh, key game timings, what do you think are the most important times in the game? First dragon spawn, first rift herald spawn, when plates fall, probably, um, that's the most important, like, game key timings. Yep, what are, what are some timings even earlier than that that are really important? Well, when the first, like, jungle caps first spawn, which is, uh, 155, is it? Then 125, sorry? And then Scott will spawn at 315. Great. So yeah, um, I didn't make the animations because I didn't have time, but they're supposed to show up individually. But yeah, so minions spawn at 105, and then uh, the minions meet mid at 127, and then, so basically like 130, and then the uh, bot lane minions meet at, or bot and top, you would say, at 140-ish. And then the most important wave, uh, probably uh, in the, like, probably in all of the game is third wave uh especially for bottom top which is the cannon wave the first cannon wave which is roughly about 230 um other than that the objectives are at 315 five minutes at for dragon and eight minutes for herald and so when we are taking these early objectives the fir uh, first i guess the three most important questions to ask is which lanes inherently have priority uh, which lanes can create priority and how you want to talk about waves so the setting up waves so for example like if you have what what is a lane that has um i, I guess prio. yeah has prio you can talk you can lucian give me nami. examples of mid or uh, mid or bot go ahead lucian nami and then mid could be anything from like anything that can like giga push it could be lucian as well even mid <laughs> Like like Victor versus Cassidy or something. Right, Victor, so Ari can get wave pressure. Yeah, for sure. So example like that. So those uh, lanes like Lucianami or like Ari Victor um, around the time of uh, Dragon Spawn and Herald Spawn, those lanes have cri priority, right? And so when it comes to the timing of the objectives right you want to think about since you can create priority how do you want to set up your waves so that by the time it spawns uh you can move to the objective to help with it right like for example the dragon spawns at five and the wave is at your tower and you're csing it you can't necessarily walk to help with the drake right so that would mean like your team losing it or like losing the fight or people dying right so do you see how they're like two separate things having priority and create like having the priority like as a lane and having priority at the spot uh, like at the point in time where you need it yes yes right and so with that you can set up your wave so that you are crashing your wave on like a can or something or you have stacked waves so that it takes longer for your lane opponent to come and match you right so the things we want to talk about for dragon and herald is that you want to talk about the priority so the three questions above and um the difference between dragon and herald is that herald is on the top side of the map so uh, in addition to the three questions you want to ask yourself does the support and or the bot rotate or swap lanes for it? So the end question is who is holding bot lane, right? So for example, you can send just the support up or you can send both the support and AD where no one is defending bot. Or you can say, let's swap mid and bot or like top and bot so that we can get Herald. Yes? Yes. Um, 
So if we begin communicating our dragon setups or herald setups with uh, one minute or less time to spawn, we are likely too late, right? So when we mean be there early for an objective, it means not 10 seconds before, not like talking about it 30 seconds before, but like more than a minute in advance. Yes? Mm -hmm. Early does not mean on spawn, okay? <laughs> Any questions about this? Okay. I like your graphics, by the way. I did not compliment them uh, in time because we were just going over the material, but I, I like your Shelly and your dragon. Thank you. I have one question, actually. Go ahead. Um, are we going to get, like, uh, what's it called? Are we going to get a copy of this PowerPoint? Sure, I can make it available. Pog. Yeah, we can put it in resources, I'm pretty sure, right? Yeah. Um, so, we'll talk about jungle tracking next. So, does anyone know uh, how long it takes for a jungler to ca uh, clear three camps? Well, it depends Roughly. on the it doesn't, it doesn't have to be exact for the record, because different champs are like different times, right? So, like, mm. when would they be able to th clear three camps and enter the opposite side river, basically? Like 2.30 or something. Pretty close. Uh, 2.45. How about for four camps? Three minutes. Three minutes? How about for five camps? You're bang on, by the way. Five camps? Yeah, he said 315. 315, 310. Yeah, 310 around, 315, pretty good. What about six camp uh, clear? Like a full clear. 325? 325, 330, right? So here they are for you um, at the top left there. Um, and we already kind of talked about the other timings in the game a little bit before. So minions spawn when they meet mid, when they meet bot. In addition to that, 315 is scuttle. And what does this mean? This means that usually junglers will reset roughly at 315 to 3, uh, sorry, 415 to 420 ish, uh, which means their second camp responds roughly at 415. So you want to be safe for, in general, top, mid, and bot until 545, which the jungle will enter top side and they will return uh, at 6.45 to 7 minutes. And this will repeat and re uh, rinse and repeat every 1 minute and 30 seconds. Which means you have a minute to a minute 30 seconds of safe play. Right? So, most important information here would be the uh, rinse and repeat every 1 minute and 30 seconds, right? If you know where they started, you know exactly where they're coming back, yes? Mm -hmm. So when do you want a ward? You want an early ward at 2.30 for bot lane and a early ward at 1 minute 30 for mid lane. And we'll talk about exactly where we're warding because that is an issue uh, for the team that we noticed, me and Pope. Yeah, um, another thing to note too, just to talk about some of these timers, is we're just trying to give like rough baselines, general timers to kind of understand the flow of the game. Because if you, if you, if you, um, like are familiar with Korea dominating League of Legends for so many years, it's because they turned the game into a clock. And so they played optimally to their timers and never deviated from the path. And it's only now are people starting to make deviations and Riot is balancing in deviations and adding in like variants to the game to kind of mix those timers up. So like when you see that second camp responds at 4.15 and then we want to be safe till 5.45, well, you'll notice it's something that Ryan and I like to have the team do is like try to sync, like talk about Dragon around like four minutes to 4.30 and get like a synchronized recall around that time because it allows us to like bypass this like unknown timer in which their jungle could manipulate fog of war and there's genuinely because we can't like blue ward their nexus you know so there's genuinely no way to know um what their jungler would be doing at that time like if their support recalls what they would be doing so when we when we base and together as a team at that time it gives us the opportunity to like play with fog of war whether we're going for dragon or we're choosing to like i don't know fucking four man dive top for no reason right like whatever we feel like doing 
it's like that it's it's both defending ourselves from an unknown timer the enemy could use and weaponizing that timer for ourselves and that's like something that i've like like when i was yelling at haitani like you have to start the recalling at 4 30 you can't just be in lane until six minutes with no base like that does not work right so this is kind of stuff to think about with that for sure any questions anyone else want to add anything to that um one thing that I forgot to mention to edit is the mid lane early ward at 130 can vary from like 110 to 130 there based on where they're trying to ward, but that's still like a good timer to keep in mind as a team. We're going to move on to vertical jungling. So before I go to the slide, what do you think that means? I think vertical jungling just means like uh avoiding the enemy jungler as much as possible so let's say you ward there um red buff at around 55 seconds or 50 seconds give or take that'll allow you to know if they started red or blue and then based on that you'll start on the opposite side of where they're starting so if they start red you start blue and if they start blue you start red that way as you're pathing you're always on opposite sides of the map does anyone want to add delete or change or what um Akita said. Uh, it's mostly for like, like if you're like invading and starting on an opposite side, you could vertically split the map. And if you have, if you're like trying to strong side bot lane, you'd like start in their uh, bot side jungle. So you could just have like perma bot prio and just play out off that, and just like weak side top or whatever, and just continually like cross map, like just continually stay on that strong side of the map and vertical uh, for the rest of the game, pretty much. Yeah. the The general premise is that. When you think about jungling, the river divides the map, right? So you have, let's say we're blue side, so you have like the west and south jungle quadrant divided by the river. Vertical jungling switches it so that the mid lane is dividing the jungle. So from blue side, you would be jungling the south and east quadrant, right? So it's just a vertical split instead of a ho like a horizontal split on the map, essentially. So that's where the term came from. But yeah, it's it's actually changing what two jungle quadrants you're planning to clear and the team is playing around. Yeah, so I think Kakita's definition, you, you kind of have it, um, you're thinking of another term. But uh, going forward, we're going to refer to vertical jungling exactly as that, uh, as what uh, Popa and Yusuf has been talking about. So like we are splitting the map down mid lane instead of splitting the map through the river. Does that make sense? Like, it's like the picture I have. It is a good picture, yes. Right, so after taking your first buff, go straight, so that's assuming you're starting on um, your side of the map, so you just like take your buff and you go straight across the river, take enemy buff, right? So um, if no one from enemy team checks on you, the enemy jungler is most likely doing the same in your jungle as well. So you are both aware of and expect each other's movements. So when do you want to vertical jungle? Uh, as Yusuf said, you want to play to one side of the map to build an advantage by overloading the one side and isolate the other. Uh, that also means that you have to understand each other's jungle path. And with that, you are choosing to create a four-man situation on bot side or three-man situation on top side that cannot be challenged safely by the enemy team. So, for example, um, broadly, we can say that, for example, clearing the east and south uh, jungle or vertical jungling, so basically bot side of the map, uh, can create four-man tower dives early in the game. So the only way they would be able to bail it out or stop you from doing that would be using TPs or something like that. Uh, what is another example of um, when you would vertical jungle? So you can give me examples of like matchups or like team comps or something. Someone who hasn't spoken yet. Mullen, what is a champ you hate playing top? I hate playing or I hate playing against? Uh, you hate playing. It starts with an O. Or... Yeah, and so what happens if you're playing a champ like Aatrox or Set or Kled or like Gwen? You can you can usually I just farm. Well, against Orn, uh, but you can usually like 
let's say it's Orin or Maokai or something like this, right? You can often create a plan with your mid laner and your jungler, or perhaps even a support um, like recall timer um, to plan like a three to four man dive on a top laner that we know cannot pressure you, right? Yeah. Uh, there are some matchups like that. So for instance, if it's like, I don't know, Zeri Yumi versus like Draven Nautilus, right? <laughs> The Draven and Nautilus are going to farm that fucking Zeri under her turrets, or they're going to lose the game, you know? So, like, you can often tell in draft um, what lanes, um, just from having a general understanding of League, even if it's not your role, um, teams want to play to, and why they would create a situation like this, where we're going to vertically jungle, and then have, like, perhaps, like, a weak side top and a strong side bot, or a strong side top and a weak side bot, right? Like, because you, you you can't you can't divide the map in a V shape, so you can't abandon mid and play through top and bot. Like it doesn't work that way necessarily. Um, so in in a scenario like this, we would be saying we have weak side top or we have strong side top. We have weak side bot or we have strong side top. And vertical jungling is a choice that can be made by the team um, to then like double down on that strong side. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe we have a kale right and kale is our team's win condition so we're going to vertical jungle to protect the kale not to do a dive right and we're going to slow the game down make kale undiveable right so these are all kind of choices you can make and when vertically vertical jungling is like a good approach to the game okay so the next thing we're talking about is reverse clearing which is what akita said earlier um so we are clearing in the opposite direction of the enemy jungler. So for example, you're starting bot and the opposite jungler starting top or vice versa. So when you want to do this is when you have a mega losing jungle matchup. Uh, so you want to ward likely entry points. So depending on the enemy jungler, like for example, Graves or Kindred or something, you would want to ward over the wall of the Dragon or Baron Pit because they're most likely going to enter from that way. And then you can also have a ward on the ramp, on an off ramp to see if they, which way they path, right? So you can, so basically if you see them, then you can talk with your team and choose to either collapse and kill the, um, enemy jungler or you are going to vertical jungle and get the free scaling time without being fear of being pressured. So when, what's an example of uh, a jungle matchup where you, you would most likely want to reverse clear? Um, basically any like bad matchups could be like Rek'Sai into Grizz for example. If you're playing yeah. Zac. Graves Viego came to mind for me, right? Because yeah. while Viego is a strong champion, Rek'Sai fucks Viego up early game, you know? Yeah, it could be it could be Zach Olaf as well. Yep. And so it gives you the chance, like Rai said, where let's say let's say for this graphic we're blue side. So we've started at our blue buff and we're moving wherever. Like regardless if we start on red or blue, right? This is just a simple graphic for the sake of explaining it. Um, we're going to base where we start based on where they start. So if they're starting on blue, we would choose to start on blue, right? And that's based off of the, the early information that we get from level one wording and stuff. And what happens is now we're as far away from that champion as possible. And so we're both clearing blue. And then let's say we want to advance to our next camp. So we're doing Gromp or whatever, and that's fine. Um, and then we see them pathing into our red side. Well, we can now safely enter their red side of the map. You know what I mean? And if if our vision or our wards um, do not spot them, then we can assume that they've gone to their own red side, and we can just freely clear the jungle as normal. And so it just kind of comes down to like this whole uniform process of tracking the jungler, where, yes, Akita, you personally would be doing this and paying attention to these things, but like every person on the team kind of needs to know this information, right? Like you have to know where the jungler is pathing and how to play around that. Because um, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you've slow pushed and stacked a wave that they're going to freeze on you so you get ganked and die, right? Especially if we're doing a reverse clear because somebody's not going to be able to come help you if they're pathing away from you as the enemy jungler is pathing towards you, right? 
So it's just all very important information to like, and it pertains to everyone. Okay, hey, so the last um, one before we'll talk about, before we see an example, is the cross map play. So it, what it means is if one team is making a play on one side of the map, the other team does a play on the other side of the map. So why you want to do this is to create, to even out the outcome of their play or gain a bigger advantage. And it can be either proactive or reactive. So if you imagine the line that I have on the uh, mid lane, so basically, for example, if they're doing a top dive, we're doing a bot dive kind of thing. And it's another way you want to, people talk about it, another term that people use is uh, mirroring. So basically, if you just had like a mirror, you just put it on the line that I have there, you're just essentially doing that as uh, when you're cross mapping. So when you want to do this is that when the team is unwilling to match the enemy or you can't make it in time to stop something, you can choose to trade it for something else. And f uh, for example, with objectives, if you can't fight the objective the enemy has priority for, dragons, heralds, barons, towers, there are other things you can do instead. For example, tower diving and taking enemy jungle. So for example, another example would be if we, if enemy team is all set up for dragon and we can't walk in or contest them, we're going to go and do the opposite side of the map, which is taking the herald or baron, yes? Yes. Yeah, mm. so there are so many times when I've like played comp and like solo queue where it's like, just take the other objective. Like, why are we fighting this when you clearly can't, right? So it's just understanding, recognizing that and choosing the... Uh, a outcome that would even out or create a bigger advantage. Yeah, and game, I, I agree. Like, so many people just smash their champions into other champions, like a fucking five year old playing with two Hot Wheels cars that he's bonking together, you know? <laughs> and it's like, you don't actually have to play League of Legends that way, right? Um, and so, like, for instance, we played Kindred in game two the other day. Um, one thing we didn't do is utilize the Kindred mark to make sufficient cross map plays, because when you have a champion like Kindred, that creates a new objective in the game that does not exist if Kindred is not there. So their team was playing to the Kindred marks every single time, right? We would see them at Gromp, we would see them at Raptors. And so they were like moving people around to play around Kindred, yeah? Because they banned Kindred game one and then let, let us pick it in game two and were prepared to play around Kindred, which is funny because we didn't play to the Kindred mark at all. You know what I mean? Like we were not either A, as a team going for the kindred mark or B going for an objective away from the kindred mark. So that's just like a, a realistic example uh, recently. And while that only pertains to kindred gaming, it's still true with this, right? Like there are situations where perhaps your bot lane is like Sivir or um, I don't know, Ash or something. And they have the ability to like play safely in their lane while we're doing a Herald is for, right? And if the enemy team opts out of compete contesting the Herald, they could go for the dragon. They could go for our red buff. They could try to dive bot lane, right? So we always have to be kind of aware because like it says, this is a proactive or reactive option, right? If you didn't have a play in mind, but you're in a position to react to a play the enemy team is making, if you can't make it to where they are on the map to stop them, or it's not worth the risk, right? Because we don't feel like we're strong enough. We can go do something fucking else, right? But it's just making sure we're doing something and not like losing um, uh, on the map for free or on the flip side, punishing teams that don't react to, like react to us or don't have strong proactive game plans for the first 15 minutes like I try to prepare the team with. So that way when we are making proactive plays and we're pushing into turrets, we're, we're gonna start working on tower dives come next week and stuff. Um, you know, punishing teams that like do not um, react to us in time. So it's like very important to always be aware and always be thinking about looking for cross map plays. Um, we're going to take a look at this um, game from a, like a world semifinals, uh, SKT versus G2, I believe. And yeah, so Perks was still on G2. Yeah. So we're going to look at an example of them doing a cross map play. More gold onto perks, which isn't 
typically the plays we see out of G2, but it looks so, like what they're going for. Now. What you I see here, um, think about like running. what you see on the mini map, right? right? If you could pause really quick, right, just so we can like address it. Um, we can all see the mini map, right? Yep. yep. Okay. So what does it look like G2 is trying to do right now? Kill the top or take the tower. Okay. Um, Dragon is coming up soon, right? 22 seconds? Yeah. So G2 is um, taking what Korean League of Legends would perceive as a bad play, right? Korea wants to be at Dragon at spawn, yes? And so, like, uh, SKT, now T1, right? SKT is going to obviously be preparing as their synchronized recalls from Fog. They're going to go to Dragon. You see Leona in mid lane, you see Nico in bot lane, you see, you know, Reactant trying to base. And they're going to try and set for the Dragon, and G2 says, fuck that, man, like, it's not worth it, right? Let's go make this top lane play. Let's take a tower. Let's push this Renekton. So now they're being seen on Vision, and so this is proactively making a cross-map play that is like they're willing to trade dragon for this, but you can go ahead and play it now, right? Sorry. Now has the phage as well. Khan is very strong at this point in the game. And right. So now SKT has hole, to react, and they're like, oh, well, shit. So like we can't actually make it thinking, right, if we take uh, to top lane right now, in time. Like you see them move for it, and then they're like, yes, fuck it. The well, let's go to the dragon like we wanted to, I guess. So you know, efforts out here clearing a ward or something. He's trying to be useful. Renekton's just like, you know, people sad. Right. And they're just using Gragas and Kaiser to take this dragon. And right here, Renekton just dies for free. And G2 is going to take Drake not Drake one, one but two towers for this. And SKT yeah. Isn't in position to make yeah. any other play, so as far as conceding in front of now, Drake, you know, T1 still gets a dragon, right? And they got vision control, and they got wave prio and bot in mid. Who do you think came out ahead on that play, though? G2. Yeah, they they took like three, four full waves, two towers, and a kill, right? Yep. Um, so. While T1 was still able to get something, right, and they got the objective that they wanted, right, um, G2 had the initiative and the gumption to, like, really make this other play that teams weren't thinking about making at the time. It's like, just go to Dragon at spawn, think of nothing else, because that's the simplest way to coach a team. But they saw a really good opportunity to hard punish top, and they did. Yeah, you can, you can definitely play this, unless that's the end of the clip. That's, like, the end of the clip, and they just take yeah. the Drake. Yeah. So, you know, like, that's always something that can be done, right? You can see on the draft, it's like, okay, well, maybe we maybe we don't want to fight for this first dragon. Um, so what we can do is we can base and we can try to, like, fuck up this top laner. We have Kled, who is, like, the best tower diver in the game, right? And we can basically, if you get either of these top laners behind, they can't play the game, right? Like, Renekton and Kled only work when they're winning. Yeah? So, so G2's approach is to turn this into a 4v5. They're already up a dragon. It's 14 minutes. Dragon spawns were different then, sure, but realistically, G2 doesn't give a fuck about this dragon. You know, it means very little to them. By comparison, they get two top towers and they kill the Renekton. It's obviously the right play. So it's just stuff to think about, right? Really a very bot side focused draft with a dominant lane in Callista Leona paired with two global ultimates in Gangplank and Twisted Fate. Mad Lions, on the other hand, have a longer range composition that wants to poke and potentially look for picks, with Jace, Lethality Varus, and Syndra. Graves can add to that long range with his ultimate, and Trundle has his pillar to both catch out opponents and disengage, with his ultimate serving as a great tool to dissuade Leona from engaging. As the match begins, G2 stand in a standard line of scrimmage, while Mad move up toward the enemy red buff. After that, they go for a late 4-man invade onto Jankos' blue buff, forcing him out of the jungle and creating a split map situation. Jankos is then spotted on the red buff due to the early award. Now the idea of a split map is to essentially isolate a lane from having their jungler impact that lane. The Mad Lions know that G2 want to play for their Callista lane, and isolating it and potentially stopping Jankos from being on the bot side of the map will limit Callista and Leona's early game power. When a split map is done, typically both junglers will resort to clearing camps on one side of the map. Jankos will be discouraged from going bot lane because his camps there might be taken. However, G2 surprised with an unconventional decision. In a normal situation, they would be in a pretty bad spot, vulnerable to potential early gank and with little to no control over the lane. 
Instead, they immediately push the wave before Karzi and Kaiser arrive and force a level 1 fight. They know Graves' bot side, so it's a tight window to execute it, but they manage to grab first blood and trade one for one. In the aftermath of this fight, Karzi lost the first wave of minions to the tower, and the wave is now in a good spot for Reckless. The early fight also pulled Graves out of G2's jungle to try to come and clean up the fight. The game's pace does not slow down as a mistake from Humanoid, who should be positioned on the bottom side of the lane, closer to his jungler, gets ganked by Yankos. Right after that, Wunder gets punished as he tries to crash his wave and is solo killed by Armut. Wunder teleports back and tries to set up a freeze, but isn't able to and his wave is in a bad spot as it's pushing out. Before he can safely ward, he is surprised by Elioya, who skipped his top camps to punish the flashless gangplank. The moment G2 see Elioya top, they make the call to dive bot with Twisted Fate's teleport. The reason this call is made is because Humanoid's death earlier forced him to teleport back to lane, giving Caps a teleport advantage. G2 dive bot. The play isn't the cleanest, as Mickey engages before Caps can even arrive, so they end up only trading one for one. At this point, we're 5 minutes into the game, G2 have a 0-2 Gangplank who is in quite a rough spot and can potentially get punished over and over. Both AD carries are even, and the big advantage on G2's side is that they got Twisted Fate ahead, which unlocks him to be able to make plays on the map. Normally, with TF reaching 6, this would be a good window to look for a play on bot lane again and sacrifice the Gangplank. But G2 probably think that it's more important to get the GP back into the game so he can withstand the Jace. So the call is made to go top and sacrifice Reckless's Callista instead. Mickey runs straight from base to the top lane and caps now his ult. G2 execute on the play and get a kill top. With this kill, they stabilize Wonder's lane, but in return, they sacrifice Reckless, who is forced to abandon bot lane. Instead, he moves to catch mid wave before going bot, but still loses half of a gigantic wave that crashed into the turret. At this point, Callista can't really contest Varus in lane due to the item disparity, so instead, G2 push out the bot lane and move into fog. The time they're in fog probably made Mad think they were getting the first dragon, which would have been expected given the composition, but instead they slowly make their way towards mid and punishing the flashless syndrome. Reckless sacrifices more resources in the bot lane, but now with top stabilized, mid ahead, and global ultimates up, G2 can shift their attention back to bot lane to zone out Karzi so Reckless can catch up. The simple threat of a TF or a GP ultimate is enough to dissuade him. Fast forward to 12 minutes and Mad Lions take the first tower with a Herald push, but at this point G2 are still 400 gold ahead and have the first dragon taken. G2's early game showed solid split second decision making in the bot lane at level 1 and when opting for cross map plays. They also constantly moved players around lanes to cover for mistakes, sacrificing bot lane to make sure the whole team was in a good place going into the mid game. At 14 minutes and seeing Matt push top lane as 5, G2 decide to respond by pushing in mid and bot. As Arma teleports bot to defend, Caps instantly TPs down to punish and is met with a second teleport from Humanoid. The play ends up turning great for G2, who take 2 kills for 0, and the game kind of fizzles out for the Mad Lions. With both TPs expended, this limits Mad's options to play the map against a Twisted Fate and a Gangplank, who can use their globals and or teleports to make cross-map plays, thus funneling Mad into playing as a 5-man unit and fighting for the Drake. As G2 set up first, Mad have limited tools to engage. Once Syndra E and Vars R are expended, G2 pounce and win a massive 4 for 1 team fight. From here, they can play in 3 lanes and play to maximize gold income, farming all lanes and stealing jungle camps. While the late game left some things to be desired from G2's side, who let Mad capture Baron and then risked it all in an Elder Smite fight, the proactive early game was reminiscent of an older G2 that used to be on top of the region. Like setting up vertical jungling, cross map plays, everything like this, right? Like the GP is down 0 2, yet. Um, and they were positioned to basically um, have Callista in a disadvantageous spot with Graves deciding to, like with Mad Lions forcing a late vertical jungle setup, right? Um, yet G2 is able to keep Callista relevant and then bail GP out of a losing situation. Um, so by straight up just understanding how the game works and making better macro plays, they were able to beat Mad Lions in a game where Mad Lions had no reason to lose right like the the stuff mad lion set up was fine their proactive like prepped draft and like angle to start the game was good it was very good um but g2 just like giga minded that game and then 
in a classic style, I mean, you can tell the kind of the games that I watch based on how I coach and how our team has performed in the past. Uh, I know I know some other players that have risked it all at an Elder Dragon or a Baron for no reason. Uh, I don't. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be us, right, guys? So, uh, <clears throat> you know. Uh, but it's an important video to kind of cover that kind of uh, subject matter. But uh, we're So we're going to do an activity now. I posted a link in the uh, general chat. Yeah, so if you want to head over there, we're just going to... Um, so on the left side, you can see that you have like um, writing utensils and stuff like that. So... Um, just use the red color, because uh, Pope is colorblind, basically, so use red. You double-click it, and the red shows up, and you can draw on the map. So, a level 1 warning. So, using your little cursor, drop a ward down, so like, color a spot where you think a good level 1 ward is, if we are starting on blue side. So go ahead, do that. Now we're going to find out who's actually linked in there. Hey, I see one. I see two. Oh. How do I somebody change the did color? it, not red. I saw a symbol, but it's not a red dot. What the f Somebody who is colorblind, I need it to be contrasted. Thank you, Akita. <laughs> yes. This is level one more, right? I can't, I can't see the black in the bush. Please do not. That's so hard. I didn't notice until you scribbled like the whole fucking map, dude. Um, so a, a few words that I were we haven't hit. I'm gonna do them really quick. Uh, bear with me because it's a trackpad. Um, because my new mouse has not arrived yet. But there's a spot right here, um, that is a good word. And there's a spot roughly around here, that is actually really good. And so what this word here does, I'm gonna make a fucking arrow at it. This word right here actually did, can see if they enter and exit the bush by raptors. If they can exit the bush on the other side of this kind of crescent wall towards red. If they are doing red and if they are doing chickens, right? Like this is a word that has really good line of sight. Um, and if you were, were to get this word, like let's say you, let's say we're in a position where mid late words, like where I posted my arrow. Obviously, you would have to know that there's not four people there waiting to put you in a browser's video, but, you know, like, if you could safely get a late word there, like, at 110 to, like, 120, um, that's actually really fucking pug, and that word will, like, destroy people's, like, clear. Uh, and all of this flips, right? So if we were on red side, obviously it's true that the inverse is, like, a good word. Um, this word is okay in, t in like, the tri bush. It's not bad. Um, because that also means like this bush here, right? And we know that this blue side tri bush is a good word, so thusly the top lane one is as well. But we basically have the second bush in each side lane, right? Um, these are all pretty good. I also think the there's a ward right here that is not in the bush but sees like all of these angles, you know what I mean? Like its line of sight is like this, right? So this word's not bad either. Um, but these are some good level 1 words I, that I think are important. I think sometimes you can be lazy, and like maybe level 1's tough, so you just word like in the fucking river or in pixel, right? If like action happened. But generally speaking, I think that there are um, there are better words, right? Like there are, we've, we've got some good ones down, and there's a few that I think are really strong, like this one, or the one, the other one that I have an arrow to. I think these lane wards are really fucking pog, right? Um, but yeah, this one's this one is surprisingly good as well, and it's safer than the one that I posted, right? This one is pretty good. Um, I I like this one a lot if you can get it. But some of these are a little bit deeper, so sometimes you have to concede that pressure because both teams are five pointing. And so you have to then choose, like, hey, let's send a couple people in to just get, like, the laziest word ever, like this, right? Where that's just the only word we can get. We run up. I'll do a different color really quick. I'll do, I don't know, maybe I can see this. We we move like this, and we just word. You know what I mean? Right here. Um, so it's important that we, we understand what good, like, level one words are and how to get them. Yeah, I would say the ones um, 
that we talk about like this one here this one and like this one that are in like the in the crescent of the buffs they're like okay to know where the ju enemy jungle s started but not necessarily where they're going to where they're going to or where they headed from right so those uh if you could get the other ones the uh the deeper ones uh are a little bit more risky but if you can get them they're pretty worthwhile but otherwise like the ones in the pit are like okay because you know like where they started and like you can deduce where they're going to but like you don't actually physically see them like going to where you think they're going to right yeah yes like there's words that you're likely never going to be able to get at level one right or like we get at the lip of this bush so like right at the edge like right 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 here what the fuck come on like literally at the the brink of this bush so it's it can see kind of to red and to crugs and stuff like some words like this are a little bit impractical which is why i didn't address them there are situations where they are good but they're usually not like i don't know how to put it like this word is way riskier for instance than this word and this word gives better info right so it's like why would you not do this one if you're going that deep into the jungle you know what i mean that's you guys. You saw where they were. Flip them. Put them in. Well, there would be a bush here. Oh, yeah. This old map. But, you know, you... <laughs> I didn't notice. <laughs> uh, oops. <laughs> I didn't notice, but it's okay. Right, so you can kind of get a feel for like what the important words are. You know what I mean? Like, these are definitely some of like the more premier level one words. Um, so it's just important to kind of think about this kind of stuff, right? Because um, what is, does anybody know what the cooldown is on the base trinket level one? It's a minute and 40 seconds, right? Some shit like that. Yeah. Am I wrong? So... Oh, goodbye, whoever left. Oh, Luhan left. Um, and so, <clears throat> when... Remember, we talked about it earlier. Let's call back to it. When is the earliest a jungler is likely going to gank you? 2.45. Make three camps. So, uh... Uh, how long does it take to do three camps again? Like a minute and 40 seconds? Yep, from spawn, is... right? Yeah. Which is 1.30, right? Yeah. So, if you use your level 1 ward, right? Like, if everyone has no ward at the start of lane, you'll have your ward back by the time it's time to ward for you to be ganked. So, like, if literally all five players use their ward at level 1, they will know. Now, mind you, jungler support might have sweeper or something like that, right? But um, if you use your ward at level 1 um, at around a minute, right? Um, be it uh maybe a little sooner right like these side lane words like i'll do the big scribble again like the the side lane words these usually happen like way earlier than a minute right because then you just base you know all the way back right and you you're getting sweeper right um you can see how far i went on my trackpad there before i had to fucking remove my finger <laughs> um but yeah if you if you generally use your ward at level one um you'll actually just have your ward up in time uh, for the first gank, so that's just like something to keep in mind that if you use your ward, unless you're getting cheese ganked, like two camp ganked or like red into level two cheese, which by the way, these level one wards can protect you from, um, you can basically have your ward up in time to like prevent like an early gank on your lane. So it's like almost like a little alarm clock to be like, oh shit, I have to like think about the jungler again, right? As your ward comes back. Um, I actually had a question. It's actually a really good question. What about giving enemy XP and money? From level 1 wards. Pope? Yeah. Um, uh, if all five people took sweepers, and then they let one person get all five wards we've put down by using an individual sweeper in each separate ward on the map, um, 
they're actually just like the smartest gamers that have ever existed and i've never mm -hmm. seen a team spend the time to do that right uh, <laughs> i don't know that it's worth that but uh i i think as long as you're not throwing the ward like in their face on purpose like if you drop the ward and all five people are standing there we know where they're starting right that ward was useful even if they get the gold or experience um which keep in mind they might hit level up like a, a like a caster minion sooner than normal depending on like what lane you're in and depending on etc cetera, etc cetera. um but realistically as long as we don't see five people and then drop a ward on them to let them clear it for free um it's okay if you like put a ward into fog and then they happen to be there that means the ward did its job right um so me personally i think that's more important than giving away like 10 or 15 gold yeah another thing with that is like um just so you know how how to take for example if they dropped a ward and you have scanner right how you take those wards is you get like the person who scans it doesn't kill it right so basically you're giving money double like money and more xp to like the people around you does that make sense yeah like if for instance we're blue side and for some reason they warded like this we could have somebody with sweeper not this is impractical they're not going to ward all three wards in this spot but this is just for the sake of example okay um you would then have somebody sweep this and people would clear these wards out right uh, that way it's sharing the gold sharing the experience etc etc we can move on to uh an example um so context uh yeah well, it's just uh, a recent game i think from yesterday where uh we see tl versus eg and how they got a level one word down so if you look at the mini map right um the only reason you'll see that tl knows where they are right that's what makes this word safe that's like important context they saw rakan and zaya they, and there's enough people nearby to where if, like, the enemy team got hot and bothered, they could, like, defend each other. They're not just psycho warding alone. So if we are getting a ward like this down, where we do not know where the enemy team is, we have to ward that. It can't just be Leona. It has to be, like, at least four members of the team helping Leona do that ward, right? Yeah. Um, so that's just something to think about, where... Uh, this word works because Team Liquid is aware of where Evil Geniuses is, and because they're aware of um, like the EG members, they get a ward down, and whether they see um, Inspired on it or not, they can determine roughly where Inspired is going to start in the jungle. Yeah, so important things about level 1 wards is that uh, you want to be placing them down soon enough so that you don't lose XP in your lane, and... Uh, as Pope said already, uh, to identify the ward, uh, to, if you, like, placing the ward is safe to do, and that means you've tracked the enemy team before you go do that, right? As you've seen in the example. Yeah, because it's, it's okay to, like, push in as a death ball if our level one is good. I say that every draft, right? How's our level one? What do we think about our invade? Are we five pointing or can we, like, get some action? Can we go and force a ward down, right? So it's always important to think about stuff like that. Like, oh, these guys have like a hook champ. They're probably gonna try to invade us, but our level one's really good. Where will they invade us at, right? And then you just anchor a push and let them run into you and they fucking gank themselves. You know what I mean? Um, so a lot of people don't um, invest energy like into level one, but I think level warning is huge uh, because it allows you to track the jungler for basically the next three fucking minutes. Um, with just one piece of information, as long as we're all talking about it, right? So, Aldi, this is for you, bud. <laughs> Understanding the 1v2 lane. Alright, so there's three important aspects, right? So, wave prep and communication. Wave prep again? <laughs> oh no, two things, sorry. Wave prep and communication. So, uh, basically, what that means is you want to identify what's happening in a 1v2 lane, rather than just not die in it. Because, like, all of us can do that, right? Like, just not die forehead, right? But then uh, the important step, the next step that differentiates, like, a good player from, like, a whatever player is, like, identify what's happening and what you can do about it, right? Um, so the first 
uh, we are talking about is uh, wave prep. So there is a difference between uh, conceding a 1v2 and understanding how to be left alone when the support roams. Which comes from the base understanding of um, wave situations, like for example, crashing, slow push, freeze, etc. Right? Um, if there's anybody who doesn't know what any of those terms mean, you can DM me and we'll have a talk later. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, for example, right, you have um, you and your support, for example, are building up. Uh, wave so let's say you are crash you are slow pushing into the cannon wave so you have two waves to crash with the cannon wave so then once you have it crash into tower the support can roam and do whatever they want for like a solid amount of time right and you just and the ad carry just like kind of backs off and does whatever right so that's a situation where you're kind of um like um, setting yourself up to do something like a proactive 1v2 lane right and on the other side of that is where you're getting crashed on then the support is not there right so for example that would be something you would also need to communicate right so uh, as, a, as an naked carry you want to talk about that with the people on your team so you want to tell them what is needed in advance so in advance again reminder is not 10 seconds before something happens it's like you know give enough time for people so that they can rotate and help you right so if you're just like no it's gonna happen but you don't say anything about it and then you expect people to like know the shoes that you are in that's not like practical right so you just need to communicate that with other people um i've played with ada carries in the past who were like wow i'm getting dove i'm like yeah i mean if you talk about it a little bit in advance, like we would there be there for you, kind of, you know what I mean? Um, so for example, some things you can say is like, I'm good for the next minute down here. They can't build the wave. So that's like signal to the, to the support that they can go make a place somewhere else. Or like something you can say is that I think they're going to try to dive me on the slow push. So that gives enough time for people to know what's going on to help you out, right? One thing to add is that, like, for example, if you can't, like, walk up to the wave or tower or you can't even stand under it, you just farm the jungle camps instead. Because most likely what your team is doing is they're doing something, like, they're cross-mapping, so the jungle is there for you to take, right? Yeah, so, like, whether whether it's top lane or bot lane in this situation, because it's often... Right, because you can't you can't just transplant mid lane somewhere else on the map. So usually, if you're like top lane or bot lane, you can just take the if your champion has the capacity to clear it. Right, um, some champs really suck at that. Right, um, but if your champ has the capacity to do it, you could always like uh, I don't know take like the jungle camp if there's not a good base timing for you. Right, so you could take the Krugs or take the Gromp or whatever based on where you are on the map. Um, cause your team doesn't need it, right? And like, there's going to be five other camps for like, uh, Akita, for example, to take in that situation, right? Cause they're probably somewhere the fuck else doing Herald, doing Dragon, prepping a dive for bot, you know, making a place somewhere on the map. So if you're alone in a 1v2, right? It's just understanding like what you're actually able to take from it and, and like, kind of just using, using the knowledge of the game that you have and actually processing it, not autopiloting. Because if you see, like, fuck, they're building a slow push, man. They're going to have this, like, in the next, like, like two waves, this is going to be under the tower. And if we think about the timings on, like, when waves arrive in the lane, we've already talked about that. That gives your team, like, anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute based on how hard they push to react. And they can say to you, uh, we're going to dive top, you have to get out. Or, um, like, I'm on my way, I can help. Or, like, I have TP, or I have TF ult, or whatever they have, right? Um... Like, I have gangplank calls for you. We can make a play. Like, stay there and look tasty, you know? So as long as we're talking about these things, uh, a 1v2 is, like, not bad. It's not a doomsday scenario. People are just like, oh, my six minions. It's like, mm. sometimes there's just, like, bigger fish than, like, the wave, you know? Because it's about the team gold, not, like, the individual gold. So there's, like, two parts to this. Again, it's uh, the same game, um, TL versus EG. And we're just gonna, we're just gonna watch through the first example, pause, talk about it, and then go through the other, the next example in the same game. 
Cool. So if we look at the map, right, uh, we can see Leona basing, right? We can see, like, Inspired and Impactor up here in top lane, right? Um, yeah. And Set is, like, slow pushing the wave back to mid. And look at where Team Liquid is going. So this is a Dragon Thunder. You can pause it here, right? So Team Liquid, upon leaving the base, this is not Leona reacting to it now. This is pre-planned, right? There was some action on the map which made both teams delay their timer for the first dragon, right? And so when Team Liquid synchronizes their recall to go for this dragon, right? Whether it's on time or late due to a previous play, instead of going for the dragon, they do the thing that we saw in that G2 video, where they're opting into a top lane play, and they're going to have Sivir sit in bot lane alone. And EG, unless they are cheating, actually cannot know that. There is no possible conceivable way for them to have that information unless they have Ash Hawkshot or something, right? Um, so in this situation here, um, EG is trying to make a play on top before going to the dragon, so you can go ahead and play it out. Fired, jumps in towards the minions, we'll get some decent damage, is Whipple gonna die, no flash? So we have set bit, gaming, the and right now Gwen does not have TP, but more. set flash. does. Not so Whippo is allowed to waste their jungle. time on that play, right? Because he can just TP go. back just if he needs to. Yeah. To walk out. Got a little dicey, but yeah, the pre-existing like no TP advantage. So here we have Trundle clearing this, Whippo's TPing, Inspired is now leaving to go for his dragon play and realizes, fuck, wait, they're going on impact here. Right? And look at fucking Core JJ. Why is this guy here? Holy shit, I'm so tilted, dude. I'm getting killed by Leona in top lane. <laughs> Why just do dragon, Liquid? But because of the way they split the team up, EG can't even trade for dragon here, right? And what is Sivir doing? Pause. She's fucking farming Krug, man. She's, like, being chilling. <laughs> like, sure, she loses a wave, but she's gonna get the Krug. It's fine. <laughs> you know? And EG gets, like, nothing for that. They might get a plate. Yeah? They might make Sivir lose, like, a wave of experience, but Sivir is going to trade that with Krug. With Krug experience, yeah? So this is, like, a really good way of using Fog of War and using synchronized recalls, making, like... Um, like kind of cross map plays from what is the expected objective because it was very clear EG expected TL to go to Dragon there. Um, and Sivir is just straight up identifying how to 1v2 in this situation correctly. Um, but I'll have you know, Verticality, um, Han Sama definitely thought about um, having himself deported from the team um, because there's going to be another 1v2 where he plays it very wrong in the same game. <laughs> yep. Go I ahead and play this. Like, this is what Sivir should be doing in this situation, right? Before we move on. Yeah? Being his team from in there, and EG did... Like, she's just straight up vibing, you know? And this is pre-planned. Look, Azir, Sivir, Leona, all basing right now, right? So let's watch Sivir 1v2 wrong. Yeah? Okay. So... I... Uh, like, Dragon's not for a while, right? Baron's not for a while. Harold's not up. Yeah. Sivir wants to take this tower. So pause. Right here, it's very clear that Team Liquid has communicated that, um, like, Han Sama cannot finish taking this tower, right? Yeah. Like, a dead ass, if this is us, we don't communicate this well enough. Verticality takes this tower and dies, <laughs> right? 100%. Yeah, 100%. And that's not to roast you guys, right? But this is like just kind of talking about it. We saw we've we've already watched Santorin and Core JJ, right? We've seen Trundle and Leona walk out of um, the EG jungle, and like visibly see these champions and these players like walking to this play. So it's on them to tell like the Sivir that this is not a play, she can, right? So they're communicating to Sivir, you cannot get this tower right now, right? Okay, you can play it somewhere. So Leona takes a base here. Vulcan should have seen it. Yeah, he's pinging it. He should have seen it. And so now on that ward, pause. Um, Wukong was seen on the Pixel Brush ward, as was Silas, right? So is what Sivir is doing right now in any way remotely legal for what was considered like the best European ADC? Let alone no. a Diamond 4 player. No. No, this is a crime. <laughs> He literally sees Rakan and Zaya on a ward, and he can assume that Wukong and Silas are coming to fuck him in the ass. Right? Okay, we'll play it somewhere. 
what does he do? He egos. He's tilted. He didn't get the tower. Um, and he outhances the play, right? He literally is just better. Oh, my. nah. JoJo Kyun is just worse. Oh, yeah. my God. So he sees three champions, not Wukong, right? This is important. So there's a little piece of context, right? So he's focused on outplaying this because he's put himself in a bad situation, right? He griefed it, and he had to make up for it so his team does not whip him with a belt later in Baudreau, right? Um, and so he has not died, and he is very grateful for this. Um, and what happens when you outplay it in a, like a team in a situation like this? It is they get easy. unhappy. <laughs> Yeah, and not only do they get unhappy, but it, it boosts your ego, so you're going to try to, like, punish them as hard as you can. Like, you're going to run up and auto-attack or throw a Q if you're Sivir and be like, ha-ha, fucking dumbass, look at you. Like, run, get out of here, you know? And deal some damage as they leave. But that's not the correct play, because you're putting yourself at, at a disadvantage, you're spending mana, and you're dropping your own cooldowns, right? Because they could technically re-dive if they wanted to. Um, but uh, it's very clear that Han Sama does not communicate that Wukong did not approach him on this play. And in the moment, it's hard to, right? And these are professional players, yeah? So this is just really good game sense from Inspired to know that he's not needed on this play. And so he cleared the ward, pretended to take part in it, and he's already almost at topside, right? So that's like a little like mystery mouse tool that EG is going to use in a second, but play this out somewhere. So Leona is almost here, but Hansama just decides he doesn't want to live. He ran back into auto and Q, uh, and then died to his own hubris. And Whippo, without knowing that Wukong is here, can no longer be in this place, right? Yep. So, like, Hansama kind of griefed it there, no? Like, pretty bad? And just gave yeah. away, like, an 1,000 gold shutdown on Whippo to Wukong, who is likely going to be the MVP this year. Uh, after losing his own sums and ultimate bot lane, dying, right? When he could have lived, he could have not challenged, he could have just backed off. And even after he fucked up the first time, he outplayed it, and then ran back in, like Cora was almost there. <laughs> uh, and he didn't tell Whippo that Wukong, like, did not show up on this play. So, not only does Whippo die here, and what Whippo does looks pretty grief, um, it's because he did not know Wukong was not on the bot lane play, which is literally the only reason Whippo is here. Um, and so this is what happens. You, you'll build a lead, it's like 14 minutes, you feel like the game's in the bag, and you just start egoing, you start like letting your hubris get the best of you, uh, and you're autopiloting a little bit. And this happens to pros, right? This is like not a scrim, this is a fucking official game between like two of the best teams in the league, right? So, like, if they can make this mistake, so can we. It's it's not that I don't expect people to fuck up. It's just, look, it's here. You can identify it and point at it, yeah? This is the kind of stuff that you really, really want to try and avoid in, like, 1v2 situations and cross-map trades, because that's, like, a, a 400 or 600 gold bounty on Sivir and a 1,000 gold bounty on Whippo at this point. So they literally just swung 1,600 gold towards EG, right? Um, and now if this game was not as blown out as it already was, that could actually put EG in a position to take Baron, or uh, take the second Herald, excuse me, which is about to spawn. So just keep that kind of stuff in mind, right? Yeah, so that's th those are some examples that literally just happened the other day, right? Like, I, I think games like that, I, I don't watch LCS as much as I used to, because I think that it's more important that I watch LEC and LPL um, for knowledge. But as a fan, I like, I like... You know, Whippo. I like like Bjergsen and Core JJ, so I watch TL's games when I can. Um, but yeah, um, <clears throat> what what do we think about like that cross map play in that one v two situation? We saw what it looks like when it's done well, and we saw how detrimental it is to like literally the other side of the map, like the top laner, right? When it's done incorrectly. Um, so like, no matter what the opinion is, it, it hurts to like watch minions die outside of your XP range and not like putting that gold in your pocket. Uh, but if the team's like <clears throat> win condition is to play away from you, uh, it's important to really identify that and like to use that knowledge to have information on what's happening and not just avoiding death, right? Because if, if Han Sama used his whole brain on that first one, well, why did he not use it on the second one, right? Because it's, it's definitely knowledge that he has. He's definitely capable of doing that. Um, but yeah, that's that's just like stuff that I think it's important that we like add into this and kind of address and talk about. But um, the other thing we wanted to do 
Yusuf, I do have like a tiny micro flame at you. Like a real small one. <laughs> I'm ready for it, dude. I'm ready. Your mid lane wards are lazy as fuck, man. Now, I understand that you were getting like 4 v one mid, and they had like 10 wards on you at all times, because you're just that handsome. But at the same time, the words you did put down were pretty ins. I was a little salty at them, but I wasn't going to give you shit yet. But after watching, like, two games and, like, seeing your POV on two, like, scrim sets and stuff, I, it's important that I think we bring it up now, right? Before, like, anything else. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. But if we head back over to the link, uh, let's do some... Everyone can participate still. And... Put down wards where you think, like, this would be, like, around, like, after, you know, the like, the second rotation of wards, basically. Like, where do you think we would, or the best places, or where, like, mid lane should put their wards? If, let's go, go where we're on blue, we're on blue side first, and then we'll do it later. We'll talk about that and do it later on red side. So let's go ahead, put down some blue side wards that the mid laner should put. Yeah, so, so the, the idea, just to clarify a little bit, Yusuf, um, if you want to go ahead and do these, like, if after you place a couple, we can have other people to chip in. Because warding mid and controlling vision in mid and in river is not only the mid laner's job. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expressly identify that now, that, like, jungle and support have a large role in helping mid lane control vision and clearing vision and setting vision. But as a mid laner, you still have your own you can put down so what is the ward you think you placed the most yusuf if you had to guess specifically what ward do you think i'm going to flame you for if you want to make a little dot for it uh is it is it the third screen yeah oh, you throw the, the the bush ward the lane bush ward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 100 percent. it's for sure this one <laughs> you just you just walk like this or like this and just put that word <laughs> yeah. yeah i fucking hate this word <laughs> It's pretty bad. It's uh, pretty bad. Why do you think it's bad? It doesn't give as much information as like any other uh, ward. Um, yeah, it, like barely gives any vision. It's just more so like a protection for me if I'm like lazy, pretty much. But uh, right. Uh, good so, ward should probably be. Here. Well, real, real, real quick, while you're filling those in, um, what I'm gonna say about these words, um, if if both teams have a pink in this bush, that's fine, right? Like, this is an okay ward, like an okay pink ward placement, because a lot of mid laners will do that, right? Um, and that one I don't hate as much. And a jungler, like, for instance, they had both of these um, river bushes pink warded in um, the second game, right? They had a pink ward here from the jungle, and a pink ward here for mid, and then support pink warded here, right? So this was, like, where they were investing their pink wards in game two like pretty extensively does the yellow one show up okay for you do you see it yeah yeah i can see it. okay so this is where their three pink words were so in in a situation where we we have teammates nearby and we want to clear these words this word becomes okay right because now we need to make sure there's nobody in here so we can walk in and clear it right um but if it's just like a lazy i'm in lane word yeah the the words you've shown right here are all substantially better, right? Do we agree? Yeah. Um, I also think, um, just to show, that way we don't have to flip it and do red side and blue side, I also think like the edge of banana brush is pretty good too. Well, that, that circle's kind of shit, but you know what I mean? Like this brush right here mm -hmm. is pretty okay for wards. And I think uh, another okay spot for control wards, the obvious um, pixel brush, right? Yeah, now, I was... Not, not to say you want to like sprint it and run this far away, or that you have 12 words to just drop at level 3. But you know, these are all like perhaps better locations than the words you were doing, right? Yeah, for sure. I, I think it's also like a uh, like a role assignment for like pinks, because I was taught that like putting them in like these bushes, the ones that you're flaming me about, like, like if I would put my pink here, and then jungler would put it in like the, the bush and river. Or putting it in like the, the the bush next to red, and yeah. like for aggressive ward pink, or if we're losing like a, a a safe pink ward like our red, if we're blue side, type of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I I agree. Warding, like I said, it's an entire team's job, right? Perhaps 
one person is gonna pink here, one person is gonna pink. Maybe we, we get a kill or something so we can move our advanced pink ward to like here. This is assuming we're on blue side, right? So we have a pink here, here, maybe we do like here or here, like either of these bushes, right, pinked. Um, so that's what, one, two, three pinks. And maybe we want um, like a pink ward in lane because we have an aggressive lane or something, right? So we're like fighting to protect a pink ward in this front bush because we're being aggro. And that still gives us room for like one other pink ward from someone, yeah? Um, maybe the top laner just has a pink um, here or here. So there's going to show a couple. Right? Nah, I don't have a pink. That's how it works. I, I know. <laughs> Uh, I am aware, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that on these slides to come. So as you can see, there's more slides, right? And you're you're absolutely correct, Yusuf. Uh, warding is a team job, but it's just important to think about what the important wards for you are, and where good pink wards for you could be, right? And it's okay to ask if you don't see like if you see your team is just not up to par or does not have the same level of knowledge on vision control that you do, it's okay to like like request your team to ward that like akita can you give me like a, a pink ward in like top pixel this guy is approaching the side of the river a lot right like i i can't walk over there and do it but or you could say like i already have a pink word like here or here you know what i mean um and all of a sudden mid is like way safer now right um you know, if you're like, dude, there's like so many wards here and like Renata is just like up my ass. Like, can the support come up and help me clear this vision? Right. And the jungler hated you, I guess, and just didn't want to come to your lane in game two and game three. Um, he was a little better about it in game one, uh, but still not great. But it was our sub. Right. And he was a last minute sub at that. Um, but <clears throat> I agree. Vision is a team job and uh, it's OK to ask for help if you can't do it yourself. But if you can do it yourself, it's important to identify which wards are good and bad wards. Because we're kind of at a place where like lazy wards are just like no longer acceptable, right? Yeah. We're like we're mm -hmm. just at a rank where lazy wards are just mega punishable. Yeah. Um yeah, I agree. and yeah. and if if teams like know that you warded that, let's say let's say where I have like the big scribbles um like on this, I'll make another little arrow. Real quick. Um so let's say for instance, right? Um, they have a they have a pink word here, right? And we've dropped a yellow word here because we were lazy. Well, now they know that this is where your ward has been spent. And for a minute or so, you don't have another ward, right? So if they have swept this area out and saw you place that, they know there's this huge lapse in vision and can start to send more people at you and attack you. So while yes, they did have like a game plan of sending people into your tower, um, a lot of that game plan actually started to um, expand upon itself as the scrim set went on based on the way that you were warding. So I just wanted to point out that, yes, the team could have helped you more. Um, yes, we are going to slowly identify how to play together as a team. Um, and yes, we're going to start assigning like wards and things like that as a team over time. Um, it's just important to know that like when you do things like this, like this word or this word, you actually kind of just like, I don't know, like advertise your own ass sometimes. I guess it's just important because cause you're like the crux of the map. So when 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 mid lane fucks up, like it's like the the biggest X, right? Because it makes like this whole fucking area scary. <laughs> so it's just important that I wanted to approach these words like while I had time to do it before we started approaching other topics like in the future. Yeah, uh, yeah I agree. I also forget about uh, this word sometimes can be useful. Uh, like Oh, see, like, all yeah. The time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's also another spot you can do it. So I like that one where it's like, regardless which side you're on, right? Like, respectively, like red or blue, putting it between these walls. Um, I know Rai likes to do it kind of closer to the wall, right? Um, which is okay. Like, there's nothing wrong with this either. Um, but I'm, I'm with you. I, I like. Um, because it gives you more time to react to their gank because it would see, um, basically, um, the vision is like a semi, like basically the only time, the only part you wouldn't be able to see is the wall itself. If you put it like 
right specifically here but like not on the wall yeah. right so it'll see like this entire area like right here right so you'll see them coming out from bush you'll see them coming out from this lane here up until like this point here you know what i mean it gives you more time yeah that makes sense yep <clears throat> so we'll talk about uh bot and top boarding next so Again, the same kind of time frame uh, for what we just did, except let's talk about uh, bot first, and then we can talk about the top after, which is basically just the rotation from that, right? So uh, let's go ahead and we can start with um, the bot laners putting down the vision. Next slide, right? Yeah, Fourth four slide. Seven, yeah. Are we just talking about like level one wards or just in general? Just in general, bot lane wards that are really good. Like the part of the, because you control, if, if you're on the fourth slide, like bot lane controls this part of the map, right? Like basically this area, maybe even a little further, like the buffs and everything. Like this is where your, your age, like realm of influence is, as well as like the lane itself, right? Yes. Uh, I'm just going to go for both sides, I guess. Yeah, yeah, we could just do it all on one slide to save time. Um, I usually sometimes put lane wards here or here, like out of tower range. Yep. Um, I'll add one really quick. Um, smack dab where the crab spawns is actually not bad, right? Um... <clears throat> yeah, I, I usually I usually put one right on where the, where the fire lamp post is right here right in the river yeah yeah I, uh, I know what you're talking about i i i agree it's a good word too i'm just saying like if if you're if you're not sure where to ward in river you can always do exactly where the crab is um another good one is here and here now these two are deeper and more aggressive but basically depending on which side of the map you're on um you can actually like let's say you force them out of lane um, the supports, so mind you, this would not be you. You'd be pushing the wave to the turrets, right? So the fort's giving you solo XP, solo gold, solo plate, something. And they know that it's safe to go get, like, a ward here or, like, a ward here. Um, and as long as you're using, like, the knowledge of what's happening in the lane, you can get this deeper vision, right? Yeah. Um, do you see any spots that you also think are good wards here, Ray? So I'll just put a white one here sometimes. Here is good. Um, like these are like situational ones, right? So like yeah. you would put this one here if like that pink, the pink, the tries pinked, right? Um, or you put one like far enough here where it's like if the try was pinked, right? Um, yeah, so um, sometimes people like to put one here, but it's like really whatever if you're on like uh, blue side, I guess, but it's just to see you coming to lane, but I don't feel like it really does anything, but other than that, and if we want later, I don't know how you guys feel, but we'll talk about this later, maybe later. I'll take this actually into the uh, practice tool so you can see exactly, because like, sure, there's like, putting a ward down in this area is great, but to effectively maximize like your ward value, there's like different places you can put the ward like in the bush versus like this corner of the bush here versus this corner of the bush here it gives you different values right so value of the ward so we'll talk about that after we go through the top wards but this is pretty good uh, mullen take over for top lane here bud yes Supposed to be a bush here, but yeah, this bush. And, and then to, to help you out, I would say um, while you're talking about the lanes, these river ones like still apply, right? Like in front of Harold and shit, because it's mirrored. Yeah. I mean, I don't really go that deep normally, but you could, I guess, put some in yeah. the river. Like, let's say, let's say, um, 
uh, Akita ha has Herald, and you and Akita just killed the top laner, and you've dropped Herald, right? And it's going to crash, and you're not even worried about it getting to the second tower, because it's going to cost too much time, and it's, like, about to die anyways. Um, so something you could do is you could get a deep board like this, if you have one on you, and get into this area with it. Um, or just take your base and, like, reset your tempo, right? Like, go back to the base and play off that. Um, so there are rare circumstances where I think it's appropriate for you, or with the jungle's help, to, like, get into here. Um, excuse me. To, get, like, get into here, or to, like, get even further into, like, here or something. Um, or even, like, warding between the towers, right? Or whether it's the bush or just between the towers. Like, sometimes stuff like this is helpful, too. Um, but overall, yeah, it's, like, roughly the same wards and shit uh, in the river. I'm just putting this one, but it's, yeah, the same idea. Yeah, I'm usually in bot lane. It's the support that goes there. That's why I can go that deep. And yeah, I get it. They have they have more wards than you do, do and so your wards are more pertaining to like your matchup and the jungler's approach. While I do agree, right? The jungle can help you with your wards, right? Like this entire section of the map, Akita can help mid and top like play with their vision here. You know, like this entire like top half of the map can be helped like um west and north jungle right takita can help set that shit up too so that's just stuff to think about um what do you three like think of this like has this been useful information for you is it a little bit too mm, like basic and fundamental like what do you think uh at least for me i think it's good i mean regardless of like how much i would know like I think it like helps the team and it makes the game uh, at least a bit more formulaic and like easier to follow and understand what's going on in the game. And I feel like it's benefiting the team. Um. <clears throat> so yeah. 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 I mean, just seeing how like other other roles are gonna want to play and how they're gonna position is nice. And just like, I mean, it's obviously some things I'm gonna have to hammer into my own head just like over time, but. It's a good baseline. It's like good knowing that we everyone what everyone needs to start off with. Yeah, right. That's that's the idea. Is it's it's literally the first one. So all we can do is the baseline, right? I can't get into some crazy nuanced shit here if I haven't made sure that you agree with each other and with us and what the base the baseline is and what the basics of it are. Yeah. So yeah. I apologize if any of the information was redundant today. Um, I do feel like it's important information to have. And I feel like it's information that, um, more often than not, we know, but we take for granted and play lazy or will autopilot at times and kind of, uh, like, I don't know, like, it's information that we are not disciplined on making sure that we're practicing. Because if, like, if, I don't know, like, even a pro player, right? If Hansama just doesn't grief that fucking Sivir 1v4 for no reason, right? EG can't play the game. Like, the game ends in the next six minutes, right? But that, like, that alone almost got EG back into that game. Um, yeah, it's it's known information, but not always applied information. Yes, correct. So it's just making sure, like, these are the kind of things that we think are important to focus on and where our starting points are, because a, a major difference, like, like, Yusuf, you could probably attest to this, a major difference between where you were at at Diamond 1 like when you, let's say your first time you were getting to your master's promos and stuff, right? Because I assume you did your promos more than once to promote up. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So where you were at then versus where you were at now, I'm sure you know more about the game now than you did before. But um, how much of it is just you hammering that you like have to do things a certain way? And, like, not allowing yourself to be as sloppy, right? Like, it's discipline. It's, like, a major factor going from where you were to where you are now. Yeah, I think, uh, actually, all of it was just discipline. Because I already knew everything. Because I was, like, Grandmaster before. And then I, like, yeah. dropped a D1. So it, all of it was just, like, disciplining. And just actually, like, applying the things that I knew, right? Yeah. Um, so that I guess that makes it easier and more hopeful for people, like, just learning. Because, like, if you just learn this stuff and apply it, then it's, like, really easy, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. like that's that's been the MO the whole time is it's like it's making sure that we all agree that it's like these are the rules of League of Legends. These are not the summoner's code, but like these are the rules of like how to play uh, and like what the fundamental like baseline information is. And if we use that information every time, right, we can consistently 
with practice and patience and discipline, um, teach ourselves how to be that same player in game one of scrim as we were in game two of scrim, as we are on Monday, as we are on Friday, right? And that consistency, like I promise you, like Mullen, that consistency and practice and like diligence to like take the five extra seconds to like get the good ward or to like not Haitani recall, right? Like you even said it out loud, verticality. <laughs> like the I one did. <laughs> I was fucking dying, dude, as soon as you said it. Like, not taking, like, recalls in, like, no man's land or in, like, the danger zone, right? Like, it's five whole seconds you just have to add on to your thing. Just take four more steps to the other direction and then recall. Or just take three extra steps and then drop your ward, right? Those little subtle differences are literally some of the minor pieces that are weighing you down and keeping you in D1. Like, I know it sounds grief. Like, you are you think you're going to have some eureka moment where it's like, oh, I'm just faker now. I promise you, dude, you're nickel and diming yourself out of Masters. And if you can, like, actually discipline yourself and, like, do this shit, it is information you know. You just have to actually do it every time. 